This is the Ultra Running History Podcast. I'm your host, Davey Crockett. Thanks. Thanks for coming. This is episode 34. In this episode, I will tell the story of the first known American Mountain Trail Ultra, a race that started in 1911 running up and down Mount Baker in Washington State. The story is packed with drama. No, not that kind of drama. Adventure, danger, disappointment, and victory. The thrill of victory. And the agony of defeat. Yes, that is a bit closer to what I'm talking about. But let's get right to it. There is a lot to tell. Well, I wish they had done that differently. How would you want them to do it? Better. <laughs> And now a word from our sponsors. How many times have you found your job really painful because of sore and chapped hands? Now at last somebody has done something about this condition. Cotton Picker's Friend is on the market. When used daily, keep your hands in tip-top condition for picking cotton. We now return to your regular programming. The 1911 Mount Baker race was America's first mountain trail ultramarathon. Yes, the first. No, mountain trail ultramarathons were not invented with the Western States 100, as some claim. This very early mountain ultra was held in the state of Washington on a volcano, Mount Baker, located in the North Cascades above the city of Bellingham. This historic forward-thinking race required participants to run between 28 and 32 miles and climb more than 10,000 feet through forests, over snow trails, across glaciers, and up to the wind-blown dome summit overlooking the Puget Sound to the west. This very early mountain trail ultra, held for only three years, involved drama, danger, and near tragedies. It also included a unique feature never to be seen again in ultras. Those in 1911 explained. The race is most unusual, combining not only mountain climbing, but automobile racing and racing of special railway train as well. Runners would race from Bellingham to their choice of trailhead, run to the summit of Mount Baker and back, and then speed back to town using cars or the train. This is not some ideal race course, but over rocks and ice and snow with an element of risk to chance. Wow, yes, it was exciting and dangerous. Mount Baker is the third highest mountain in the state of Washington at 10,781 feet. It is located about 30 miles east of the city of Bellingham and is the second most thermally active volcano in the Cascades after Mount St. Helens. In 1975, a large quantity of muddy steam rose into the sky, turning much of the ice-filled crater into a steaming lake. An eruption was feared, so the mountain and Baker Lake were closed for the summer. Thermal activity gradually declined in the following years. In 1792, British explorer George Vancouver surveyed the Pacific Northwest coast. Of Mount Baker, he wrote, about this time, a very high, conspicuous, craggy mountain presented itself towering above the clouds covered with snow, called by me Mount Baker. Edmund Thomas Coleman from England was the first known Anglo to attempt to climb Mount Baker. He succeeded on his third attempt in 1868. With the traditional spiked boots, knapsack, provisions, rope, pole, etc., they commenced the real ascent and at 4 p.m. stood on the summit. The last 500 feet were accomplished by the use of a pick to make footholds in the ice. On top, they raised the stars and stripes. In 1910, in the Bellingham area, there was considerable interest whether climbers could summit the mountain and be back to the city within 24 hours. The local newspaper posted a $100 reward to anyone who accomplished it. Two rival towns, each with a trail, Deming and Glacier, debated which of their trails was the best. 
There has been considerable talk, however, about a race between parties on the Glacier and Deming Trails. A race of this nature could probably be arranged and all disputes settled. In 1911, Arthur J. Craven, a brilliant lawyer, was president of the newly founded Mount Baker Club with about 30 members. He approached the Bellingham Chamber of Commerce with the idea for a race to the top of Mount Baker. The idea was pursued and the Chamber of Commerce of Bellingham, Washington announced that they were going to hold a race on August 6, 1911 to the top of the mountain and back with a prize of $150 to the winner. The main motivation for the race was to draw attention to the area and also find the best route to the top of Mount Baker. What was first called the Mount Baker Race would be unique from any other race organized up to that time. Not only would it be a running race, but it would involve racing in automobiles and trains. And even more amazing, the race to the summit and back would be performed in the dark when the snow and glacial ice was firm and do it in the days before flashlights and battery-operated headlamps existed. The race would start from the city of Bellingham, a city of about 24,000 people, and go to Mount Baker Summit and back. Participants had two choices for their routes to the top. Route 1 involved taking a speedy special train for 44 miles to the town of Glacier, where they would then run the Glacier Trail for 28 miles to the summit and back. On return, they would ride the train back to Bellingham to the finish. Total miles for this option were about 116 miles. Route 2 was to go by unreliable automobiles of the time on rough roads for 26 miles to Heisler's Ranch and then run the Deming Trail for 32 miles to the summit and back. The Deming Trail was longer than the Glacier Trail but involved a shorter snow climb. On return, they would ride back to the finish in their automobile for a total trip of about 84 miles. The first runner to reach Bellingham would be the winner. The fastest known time up to that point was about 34 hours. It is believed that the time will be cut squarely in two and demonstrate conclusively which is the faster trail to summit. The day before the race, four judges left for the summit where they camped and made preparations for the race. Fifteen checkers would also be stationed on the trail. On August 9, 1911, a little after 10 p.m., the race started from the curb in front of the Bellingham Chamber of Commerce on Dock Street. Six runners went by cars to Deming and eight by train to Glacier. The men were started by the discharge of a pistol and the dash began for the automobiles and for the special train waiting two blocks away. Like a regiment on charge, the contestants clambered helter-skelter into the already moving automobile machines while the balance went for the special train. The race was on. The motor cars quickly gained a speed of 35 miles per hour. The speed at the Elk Street turn was terrific for much depended upon the car first to leave the asphalted streets. The train with whistle screeching a warning and bell a clanging chugged its way to Glacier. Fainter and fainter and faster and faster sound the explosions of its exhaust. By the time the cheers of thousands of spectators had died away, cars and train had disappeared. Up until midnight, huge crowds paraded the streets or attempted to cram the newspaper office anxious to glean any information about the progress of the race. The people ran about the streets like lunatics, shouting and cheering, trying to get news. The train was driven by John Gullathon. He was later asked how fast it was traveling. I don't know. She was going like hell. After about 50 minutes, it approached Glacier. Her headlight was visible at Glacier. Two minutes later, she had come to a stop, still hissing and throbbing at the depot, and the contestants hit for the hills. Harvey Haggard, age 19, was a packer for the Poison Mine Company. He had a small build, but had steel muscles. He jumped off the train at Glacier. He set out for the top of the mountain on a trot, reaching the summit in first place at 5.18 a.m. When he arrived, the air was full of snow, with an estimated 70 mile per hour wind. 
Haggard was garbed only in his underclothing, the only clothing worn by him in this spectacular dash to the peak. Haggard was wrapped in a heavy blanket and permitted to rest for four minutes' wait imposed by the judges on all candidates. Now to those taking the automobiles. Joe Galbraith, age 25, was a former athlete at the local high school in Bellingham, where he played lineman on the football team. He was a rancher and also a logger. After the start, Galbraith quickly boarded a stripped-down Model T4 named Betsy, driven by Hugh Deal, who owned the local Ford dealership. They went at a terrifying speed, up to 50 miles per hour, heading for the Deming Trail. Galbraith huddled down low in the seat of the motor car and wrapped hold-on straps around his wrists. Deal careened 27 miles up rocky, rutted road and often plowed through deep mud. Turner Riddle, age 28, was a logger and a farmer. Riddle also headed toward Deming in an automobile. Riddle described the start. We tore up the road. The Ford car, Betsy, passing just in front of the special train which was steaming up the tracks for all it was worth. We crossed the tracks just behind the train, out upon the country road, lined densely with people we sped. One car driving two runners broke down and they were out of the race. The high speed and rough roads had proved too much for the automobile springs. They returned to Bellingham during the night. Joe Galbraith was the first to reach the Deming trailhead after nearly an hour, with the next car only a minute behind. Galbraith started on a trot up the mountain. For light, Galbraith and the others carried what was called a bug, which was a Crisco can with a candle poking through it, used by miners. Riddle was about a half a mile behind. After two miles, Riddle's candle burned out. I went to look for the other candle that I had stuck in the top of my sock, but it was gone. I stumbled on in the dark, losing the trail once or twice, and fell into a creek. Galbraith arrived at the snow line around dawn and picked up one of his brothers to pace him. Yes, pacers were allowed and encouraged at the snow line. The snow was hard and in excellent condition for traveling. He arrived at the summit at 5.37 a.m., 19 minutes after Haggard, who had used the glacier trail on the other side of the mountain. Only five of the 14 starters would reach the summit. After registering at the summit, Galbraith started his return trip. He ran down the mountainside, over the snow that was beginning to melt under the rays of the rising sun, through the fields of flowers at the snow line, and down through the forests. Over on the glacier trail, Haggard, with a shorter trip down, was the first to reach the trailhead at 9 a.m. with a 28-mile round-trip run of 11 hours. He boarded the waiting train and started back. He took off his sweaty clothes and was given a rubdown by another runner, Tom Kelly, who had only gone partway up the mountain and then returned. The train sped back toward Bellingham, and he was clearly the leader heading to victory. As the speeding train rounded a corner near Maple Falls, it hit an 1,800-pound bull, derailed, and went into a ditch. The bull, flung high in the air, fell a distance ahead of the engine, was ground under the wheels, lifting the front trucks of the locomotive from the rails. The engineer had absolutely no chance to stop at the rate of speed at which the train was traveling. Both the engine and the coach were overturned, but by some strange miracle, no one of the crew or passengers was hurt. Hadward, lying naked in a bunk, hit the ceiling of the coach, was slammed into a corner, and bounced back among the seats. He climbed out and said, I am all right, but I am afraid I've lost the race. He dressed and was delayed for about 40 minutes. He first hitched a ride on a horse buggy to Maple Falls and then rode a fast horse towards Kendall. Haggard said they were moving so fast that the scenery looked like it was a moving picture film running amok. He took a spill off the horse when it was spooked by a waiting automobile at Kendall. The driver picked Haggard up and put him in the car. Haggard fainted twice on the way back to the city. It was estimated that all his hard luck had cost him about an hour. 
Galbraith had much better luck than Haggard on his return trip. He rejoined his driver, the Ford was cranked up, and Galbraith put on a heavy overcoat and goggles for the trip back. He was so tired that he had to strap himself into the car so he wouldn't fall out. On the way back, they approached a woman standing by the road with a horse. The speeding Ford frightened the woman who fell on the road. Deal quickly turned the machine into the ditch. Missing the woman by a few inches, careened away over the very point of upsetting then writing, and again took up the wild race toward Bellingham. Word was received at Bellingham that Galbraith was on his way back. The crowd would have tripled if it had been dreamed that the racers would have made the trip to the summit and return in such a remarkably short time. The crowd that lined the streets were craning forward, waiting for the approach of the machine. Soon the four dashed around the corner and whirled up the curbstone in front of the Chamber of Commerce. Galbraith leaped out of the machine, hopped up the stairway and registered, writing his name in a firm hand. Cheer upon cheer arose from the crowd when he returned on the street. He finished with a total time of 12 hours 18 minutes, crushing all predictions. Covered with mud and exhausted, he accepted the cheers of the adoring crowd and was greeted by his family. Haggard's approach to the finish of the race was even more spectacular because word spread about his hard luck. The crowd went wild. Haggard arrived in second place 32 minutes behind Galbraith. Galbraith won $100, but Haggard was the hero of the spectators and proved that the Glacier Trail was actually the fastest route to the top of Mount Baker. A hat was passed around, raising $50 for him, and an additional $130 was thrown in by local communities. The town of Glacier elected him King of Glacier. Days later at Glacier, the dead bull was barbecued for a big banquet in the Hager's honor. The owner of the dead bull presented a bill of $40 to the Bellingham Bay and British Columbia Railway. It was paid. The 1911 race was viewed as a success, and plans started right away to make the race an annual event. In 1912, Henry Enberg became the new president of the Mount Baker Club. The race received the name of Mount Baker Marathon. Race day was set for July 24th with a big festival associated with it. Unfortunately, on July 8th, Joe Galbraith, the defending champion, was in an automobile accident and suffered a broken shoulder and a severe gash in his leg. He, along with other runners, had been training on the mountain for the past several weeks, but his injuries forced him out. The town of Concrete, located on the south side of the mountain, wanted to get into the game and also have runners make use of its trail for the 1912 race. It was decided to permit them to be part of the race. The distance from Bellingham to Concrete was 51 miles by train. The trail round trip to the summit was believed to be 42 miles. They wanted to allow the runners to ride a horse for five miles to a trailhead to cut down the running miles. In June, serious work started constructing a new concrete trail, but in early July, concrete pulled out of the race, claiming that the railroad could not deliver on a promise for a fast train. Concrete announced that it would hold its own race on the same day, which would originate from their town. More precautions were put into place that year. Relief parties would be stationed at the end of both trails with physicians to offer their services in case of accidents. It is feared that if a storm arises on the mountain during the marathon, some of the runners may lose their way and searching parties will be ready to go to the rescue. The racers will carry searchlights during this race. Without ham radios in that day, 14 miles of telephone wires were strung up both trails to checkpoints two miles apart and nearly to the summit. Runners training on the mountain helped put up the line. On July 23rd, the judges left to climb to the summit as heavy rain fell. A runner making a practice trip to the top of the mountain reported the discovery of two men wandering about helplessly lost and on the verge of death from starvation and exhaustion. The lost men had been those who had been sent up ahead to put up a shelter for the judges. They had been lost for six hours, wandering on snowfields, and finally took shelter along a ridge of rocks rising from the snow. 
One of the men had become deathly ill from exposure and became delirious. The judges made several attempts to climb the glaciers from the Deming Trail, and each time were caught in blinding snowstorms which forced them to retrace their steps. They feared for the lives of the 16 contestants, hurried to the foot of the peak, and advised headquarters by telephone that the contest must be postponed. The discouraged and disheartened race committee met to decide what to do. One of the returning judges said, To start men up the mountain would be to send them to their deaths. After hearing the report, there was no doubt left that human effort could not conquer the obstacles nature set in the way of the race. The race committee decided very reluctantly, only three hours before the start, to postpone the race for at least a week. That night, July 24th, Concrete's independent race was still held on the mountain starting from the town of Concrete. Only Herman Schreiber dared to go up in the storm. He used relays of horses to get him to the snow line and then attempted to scale the peak along with a judge. For hours the two men battled with the blizzard, finally reaching the yawning crater about three quarters of the way up the mountain. There the wind was blowing a gale, the cold blasts laden with thick snow. They were forced to turn back, returning safely after nearly 11 hours and 40 minutes. On the postponed race day, July 31st, 1912, storm clouds again gathered around the summit and the prospect for the night start didn't look good. There were only nine starters. The race did go forward as planned that night. A large number of visitors came from all parts of the Pacific Northwest to watch. The starter's gun was fired at 11 p.m. Harvey Hagard, who had all the hard luck the year before, and five others took the speedy train headed for the glacier trail. When reaching the trail, the rain began to fall, and they climbed into snow and dense fog. The last 400 feet to the summit seemed like it took the most time. Paul Westerland was the first to reach the summit from the glacier side. Hagard and two others ran closely down the mountain. Halfway down, they passed Westerland, who had spent too much energy breaking the trail for the others on the way up. When the three arrived at the train, they arrived in a virtual tie. It had been anticipated that multiple runners would likely take the same train back to Bellingham, so the agreement was that once reaching Bellingham, they would sprint on foot to the finish at the Chamber of Commerce in the order they had reached the train. Hagard won the sprint by 10 feet for a wild finish. Actually, on the train going back to Bellingham, the runners agreed that Hagard should win because he had the fastest time on the trail. So the final sprint from the train to the finish was more of a procession than a last terrific exertion of tired muscles and exhausted sprint. Hagard's total time was 9 hours 51 minutes, crushing Joe Galbraith's 1911 course record of 12 hours and 28 minutes. What happened to the runners who raced in automobiles that went up the Deming Trail? Three automobiles raced out of Bellingham. John Magnuson rode in Baby 40, who Galbraith, Joe's brother, in Betsy 1, and Turner Riddle rode in Betsy 2. Magnuson's car smashed its frame about one mile from the Deming trailhead, but he was able to continue slowly. The Betsy too had developed engine trouble, but Hugh Galbraith let Riddle ride the rest of the way with him in Betsy 1. Magnuson started on the trail eight minutes behind the others. Hugh Galbraith turned around at Bell's Ranch because of heavy rain. He thought it was too dangerous to continue. The other two arrived at the summit about 50 minutes after those who had went up the glacier trail. Riddle and Magnuson raced neck and neck back to their automobiles. Because both of them had broken down cars, replacements had been sent out while they were still on the trail. Magnuson's replacement car overheated about six miles from the finish, and he was passed by Riddle, who finished in 958 in fourth place, just seven minutes after the leaders who went by train. So it was really close. The 1913 race was held even later in the summer that year on August 15th, and the race organizers rather foolishly started it at 5 a.m., sending the runners up the peak during the daytime when the snow and ice would be soft and dangerous. They did this for financial reasons, to attract the crowds at the finish in the afternoon. 
20 other events were held in conjunction with the marathon. It was a huge city festival. Race organizers understood that the glacier route with the train ride was the faster of the two routes. They decided to change up the race format. If you went up the Deming Trail, you came down the Glacier Trail and vice versa. So they took the train on one leg and cars on the other. Thousands came to Bellingham and the mayor proclaimed a business holiday. About 20,000 people watched as Paul Westerland of California came into the city and finished first with a record time of 9 hours and 39 minutes. Westerland had gone up the Deming Trail and down the Glacier Trail, going by car and returning by train. But the race led by race director Dan North, a city attorney, was poorly managed that year. At some point, the race committee had decided that because of recent storms, the runners would not go clear to the summit and would instead go as far as the saddle and return, which Westerland did. But the runners on the Glacier Trail, who went by train, claimed they never got the word. The race staff insisted that they had informed the runners of the change during the previous night's race briefing and that the runners were also reminded by observers along the trail. However, because of the bad weather conditions, some of the judges and observers had left their posts and headed down from the mountain. Through some misunderstanding, and because there were no judges to guide them, the men who ascended on the glacier trail, in reality, went clear to the summit. Thus Westerlund won because he only went to the saddle and back, avoiding the additional 1,000 foot climb to the summit. At the finish, several runners who went up the glacier trail protested the results. Eventually the first place prize was split with Magnuson, who was the first to return from the summit. All of the controversy became secondary. As the city was celebrating the finish, Victor Galbraith was missing on the mountain. He had reached the summit using the glacier trail, but then he went missing as he was descending during the afternoon. His cousin, Joe Galbraith and others, organized a search party early in the afternoon and started out in a sleety blizzard to try to find him. Victor had fallen into a 40-foot crevice on his way down from the summit on the Deming Trail. He could not pull himself out and was dressed in only scant running clothes in the cold weather. He shivered as he waited, hoping for rescue. Millard Burnside, who had been following Galbraith's footprints down the mountain, noticed that they had stopped, but he went on. Two hours later, he was able to direct the search party to the point where the footprints disappeared. Joel Galbraith and his brother heard Victor's shouts for help coming up from a small hole in the snow. They dropped a rope noose around one of his feet and hauled him to the surface. He was suffering from severe shock and exposure. They immediately took him down to the ranger's camp located at the snow line on an improvised stretcher and blankets. Victor recovered and his only injuries were from bruises. Victor later talked about his ordeal. His first thought when he broke through the crust was to wonder if he had struck a wedge bottom crevice. His next thought was to mentally remark that he guessed he was out of the race for the year. He informed the rescuers that he had not worried while in the crevice, as he was sure that his relatives who were waiting at the snow line would come for him. Because of the controversial results of the 1913 race, Westerland, who was first proclaimed the winner, wanted to prove that his win was legitimate. A head-to-head -head match between Westerland and Millard Burnside, who had been the first to the summit, was arranged to be held from the town of Glacier. The runners would run up and down the Glacier Trail. This race was held about a week after the main race. About 1,300 people came to Glacier to watch the start. It was the largest crowd of visitors the town had ever seen. Light rain spoiled some of the day's enjoyment. Clouds enshrouded the hills above and the morning was unusually cold. The match race started at 9.03 a.m. at the crack of a starter's pistol. The runners, dressed in only light track suits and running shoes, started at an easy lope as spectators lined the course cheered. The two ran together for three miles as the rain continued to pour. They were only 50 feet apart at the 10 mile mark at about two hours. Burnside arrived first at the top by eight minutes in a blinding snowstorm and fog with a very impressive time of three hours and 54 minutes. 
All the way down the mountain, the two runners were close together, and everything looked favorable for Burnside. But with three miles to go, Burnside, with a bad ankle, finally could go no further. Westerlund was sprinting down the trail at a lively clip, running strong, outdistancing everybody who tried to follow him on the trail. He finished in a staggering six hours, two minutes, crushing the trail record by more than an hour and won $1,000. Burnside came limping 37 minutes later. The hat was passed for Burnside, and he also went away with a tidy little sum. The race was discontinued the following year, not because of safety concerns, but because of financial reasons and the difficulty finding those who were willing to sponsor the race. But in 1915, there was serious consideration and enthusiasm about putting on the race again. Plans were put into place to have runners all ascend the same trail and descend the other. But the Mount Baker club leadership changed and the race wasn't held. The club soon went dormant for many years. Nearly 100 years later, in 2012, ultra runner Dan Pobst of Bellingham re-established a version of the race. In 2017, 17 runners towed the starting line for the first time in more than a century. The Mount Baker Ultra is now competed entirely on foot, covering more than 46 miles from the town of Concrete to the summit of Sherman Peak and back. The 2020 race will be held on May 21st, 2020. The course runs on four service roads, seven miles of snow trail, and on about three miles of a glacier section where runners use required harnesses and are clipped to fixed ropes. You don't need to be an experienced mountaineer, but basic training is encouraged to learn how to self-arrest and know how to use the equipment. To be part of this amazing reenactment of history, register at Ultra Sign Up with a very reasonable entrance fee. With that, this is Davy Crockett, and this is the Ultra Running History Podcast. I hope you run fast and far, enjoy life, get outdoors, and most of all, stay safe and don't take unnecessary chances. Mm -hmm.